All right, hello, welcome Employment Law Show. John Scholes and co-founding partner of Sam Firu to Markin LLP, the most positively reviewed employment law firm in the land right there, Lior Sam Firu. Thank you so much for joining us. Next 30 minutes, a lot to cover. We're going to get to some phone calls from our long-running radio show, and we'll get to the guide to handling a bad boss. That's going to be interesting. Stick around for that here in just a bit, but we always start with some contact information, 1-855-821-5900, employmentlawyer.ca, and help at employmentlawyer.ca to reach out through email as well. There's a few more things we want to tell you throughout the uh, half hour to way to uh, reach Lior and his crew, which we will get to. But, pal, we always start with the, uh, the week that was. What's going on with you? Well, another tremendously busy week, a mm -hmm. lot of calls. You know, I barely made it here on time to do the show because I was answering all kinds of emails. Uh, people have a lot of questions about their rights. Well, I like to answer them. That's what I do. That's what my, my team does. And I've been dealing with a lot of questions, especially with respect to vaccines and mandatory vaccines now and the rights of employees and temporary layoffs, leaves of absence, you name it, I'm answering. So keep bringing those questions on. And on the show, we'll talk about all these important pieces of information, laws, regulations, rules that you need to know if you have a job, if you lost your job, if you're struggling with a bad boss, if you have an assault and made him a line in the sand that you don't know what to do about, we'll deal with all those things. But of course, we only have 30 minutes. If we can't get to your specific situation, the thing that's really top of mind for you, not a problem, reach out to me off air. We'll give you that contact information throughout the show. Employment laws are important. They're still here for you. You may hear of all kinds of things that are suspended and closed and shut down. Well, not employment laws. They haven't been shut down. They haven't been put on, a, on hiatus. They're still here to protect you. And on this show, and every time we're on air, and every time I respond to someone, to an email, to a phone call, that's what I do is we talk about those rights. And to give you an example, week that was, let me tell you about a situation that came across my desk just over the past few days. I spoke with a gentleman that had been off work for about six months because of a, because of a severe uh, injury. He was in a motor vehicle accident. He was injured. He could not work. He was off. He was receiving disability payments and was working hard, physiotherapy, et cetera, to get better. Well, after six months, you know, working hard, he actually was good enough to come back to work, although not full time. He was able to go back to work, his doctor said, starting with one day a week and then hopefully over time working his way back up to full-time duties over a period of perhaps a couple of months. So he very excitedly contacted his employer and he said, I'm ready to come back to work. My doctor said, I'm ready to go. I've worked my, my rear end off to get to this point. Well, his employer didn't seem as excited mm -hmm. and his employer said, well, no. Until and unless you're able to go back full-time and you can get us a doctor's note saying you could do your job full-time with no restrictions or limitations, we can't have you back. So get back to us whenever you're, you're better. So obviously he was upset because he was so looking forward to getting back to work. He called me. And what he wanted to know, of course, is can they do that? Do they have to or do I have to wait till I'm completely uh, all better or can I go back to work now on some modified basis? I hope really that our regular viewers know what I'm about to say. His employer has a very strict duty and obligation to accommodate him. We call that the duty to accommodate. It's under our human rights laws. That means is if he can do his job but he has restrictions, his employer needs to find a way to fix it, to make it work. That means giving him modified hours, modified duties. That means being flexible with his schedule whatever they need to do to make it happen. And what they cannot do is say, no, no, we don't want any part of that. That just sounds too hard. We don't want you back until there's no worries and you're, there's no more health issues. That is a failure to accommodate. That is a breach of his human rights. And because of that, not only is his employer doing something illegal in, in breaching his human rights, he can consider himself, if he wants, consider himself to be terminated because his employer is not doing what it's supposed to do. So I hope there's a lesson there for employers and of course employees. Your employer has to accommodate you, even if it's difficult, even if it does cost some money, they have that obligation to accommodate. And an employer that doesn't do that, yeah, it's gonna find itself in significant legal trouble. Is there, a, is there a threshold, in other words, how far does any given employer have to go as far as accommodation? Because you could imagine a big multinational corporation sure. would have, you know, deeper pockets and be able to do more accommodation than a mom and pop shop. But is, is there a level where they just say, I'm out of options, I can't help? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And certainly th that duty to accommodate is not infinite. It's not something that the employer has to, you know, create a new plant just to accommodate an employee. We call this accommodation to the point of undue hardship. 
What that means is that at some point, it's going to be so hard and so difficult to accommodate that, no, you don't have to go that far. But keep in mind, the, the bigger the company is, the more resources they have, the more is expected of them to do in accommodating. And what I've seen countless times over the years, a company not wanting to try. Yeah, it's going to not be the easiest thing in the world, so let's not bother. Let's just forget about this. No, that's a human rights violation if your employer just won't try and accommodate. Reach out for those and any other questions, of course, anytime, 1-855-821-5900, the website, employmentlawyer.ca, which is where you want to go to catch links to our radio show all over the country and catch a station that carries it near you. It's an hour long. Again, you'll learn lots and an opportunity for you to call into those shows and ask your questions there as well. We'll get to our first call from our radio show, uh, Lior, right now. Being laid off, and I was just wondering, our company is, they didn't renew their lease. They're giving another company their work that I did. They're paying them, to, I guess, to do it. The real issue is that of severance. How long have okay. you worked for this company for? 21 years, 8 months. What kind of a job and how old? 60, and it's a warehouse supervisor. How much severance they've offered you? 9 months. Ooh, that might be a little light. Yeah, well, it is extremely light. So she's upset that you know they're kind of getting rid of her position, yeah. that they're giving it to someone else. And I get that. I would be as well. I think you would be too. But from a legal standpoint, let's talk about that from a legal standpoint. From a legal standpoint, it's a question of severance. Their, her employer is allowed to let her go. His, her employer is allowed to say, no more work here. We're going to get rid of this job. We're going to outsource it, what have you. But they have to pay severance. So the question becomes, 60-year employee, 21 years of service, a long time. Yeah. How much severance she's owed? Her employer thinks it's only nine months. Well, not so fast. Let's go to pocketemploymentlawyer.ca, again, pocketemploymentlawyer.ca, and let's input her information into our severance calculator tool. You're going to be able to see on screen, here's how that shakes up. So this employee is in a supervisory role, been there for 21 years, and is 60 years of age. Well, her employer says nine months is all you get. Well, we can see what she's owed is up to 24 months pay. 20 to 24 months pay. Now, I did some math here, John. If she, let's say, makes about $60,000 or so, that difference is going to be over $55,000, oh. okay? That is the difference here. So even though what she's upset about is being let go, and I get that, what she should be focusing on, what you should be focusing on as well, if you lost your job, is the amount of severance. Chances are you're owed a lot more than what the company is offering. And that, and that $50,000, I mean, not to say she won't get hired again, but once you're, you know, once you're 60, I mean, it, it's, it's tough to get a gig. It just is. You know, at 45, it's tough to get a gig, never mind 60. So she's going to need that extra money to carry her through, possibly, until she gets another job. Which is exactly what severance is supposed yep. to do. It's your insurance policy. It's there to help you, support you, until you find another job. And the law accounts for the fact that someone that's 60 may have a harder time finding a job than, let's say, if they're 40 years old. Well, in that situation, severance is going to be more. So once you accept that severance offer, let's say she accepted nine months of severance and it took her 18 months to find another job. What does she do? How does she pay the bill? How does she support her family for the remaining nine months? That's why it's important to get this right from the beginning and not to accept anything. And I do mean anything until you've gotten the proper advice. Another place to go for questions, terminationquestions.com. That whole website is anonymous, but it's built for you to ask your questions and get Lior's team to answer them and, uh, and give you more satisfaction. We'll get to one first one for this show again, terminationquestions.com. George says, I was let go unexpectedly from a great job after 11 years at a company in a professional role. My, God, uh, my boss gave me a check for eight weeks' pay as severance. When I asked if I was owed more, he told me, I could check with the government for reassurance on the amount. Well, we know where he went. Yes, and you know this is important. So we, we talked just before uh, with our, that, that caller whose uh, uh, call we played that most people are offered a lot less than they're owed. Well, there's a reason why a lot of times employers get away with that, and that is because the government, whether you're in Ontario, BC, and Alberta, doesn't matter. Government only advises you about your minimum entitlement. So if she were to call the government after 11 years of service and say, hey, Ministry of Labor, Employment Standards Branch, whatever it is, I was let go after 11 years. How much am I owed? They would have, she would have been told eight weeks pay. She would have. Why? Because those are her minimum entitlements, mm -hmm. only a small fraction of her full entitlements, but that's the only thing the government advises you on. 
Well, her full entitlements, her full legal entitlements, we call that common law entitlements, are significantly more than eight weeks. So let's go back to severance pay calculator on our pocketemploymentlawyer.ca website, and let's see how much she's actually owed. So we know she's a professional, been there for 11 years, and we know she's been offered eight weeks pay because maybe that's what the government sure. says. But you see right there at the bottom, she's owed 12 to 14 months pay. 12 to 14 months pay. That's probably going to be a six-figure difference easy. So because of that, it's so important. If you lost your job, go to pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. Call me. If you don't like me for some reason, I don't know why you wouldn't, call another employment lawyer. That's okay. But cannot, should not, never go to the government for this. Unfortunately, the government cannot advise you about your full termination entitlements. Okay, short break, but coming up here after that break, our topic for the day, Guide to Handling a Bad Boss. How about that? Stick around for it. In the meantime, 1-855-821-5900 and employmentlawyer.ca. It's the Employment Law Show. We're coming right back. People think contractors aren't owed severance. Employmentlawyer.ca says that is a myth. Many contractors are actually employees and are entitled to full severance pay. Always check with the employment lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. How do you force insurance companies to pay long-term disability claims? Insurance companies deny legitimate claims all the time. They're playing the odds. They know that most people are just going to walk away. Your insurer may ignore you. They may even ignore your doctors, but they can't ignore us. We know how insurance companies work. We know their weaknesses. We know how to use the legal process to force them to pay you what you're owed. Go to disabilityrights.ca. Discover your rights, fight back, and get what you're owed. People think you are only owed two weeks pay when you lose your job. Employmentlawyer.ca says that is a myth. You may be owed much more than two weeks per year. Don't settle for less. Always check with the employment lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. All right, welcome back. Employment Law Show, John Scholes, Lior Sam Firu. Reaching out any time, Sam Firu to Mark in the most positively reviewed employment law firm in the land. 1-855-821-5900. We put that in the other contact information up on the screen all the time. But I know you love this subject. We're going to get to it, Lior. Guide to handling a bad boss. How about that? Yeah, I'm going to need you to come in on Sunday. That'd be great. Yeah, I mean, I, I know about being a bad <laughs> boss. I'm not sure about, uh, yeah. well, no, I'm kidding. This is certainly a serious issue. Yeah, for sure. Because usually workplace problems start with a bad boss, with that, that bad apple, so a, a boss that doesn't treat you properly, and that can create all kinds of other issues and that escalates from there. So we want to talk about how to deal with the bad boss in those situations. <sighs> Easiest way to ask the question is this, what kind of bad boss exists in the workplace, at least here, right? Well, th there's many kinds, but I think I'll put them into two categories. Uh, first type of bad boss is the boss that really ignores you forever until there's an issue, and then the moment you do something wrong, it becomes the biggest issue, and they're trying to find a way to, to blame you for something, maybe push you out. So that's the boss that ultimately jeopardizes your job and job security because they don't support you when they need to support you and when you maybe you've done something wrong or they perceived that you've done something wrong, they'd be the first ones to try to push you out the door and, and try to blame and accuse you. That's bad management, that's a bad boss, and that certainly has some legal consequences to that which we'll talk about. Second type of bad boss is the boss that mistreats you, harasses you, bullies you, uh, and, and makes your work life uh, or, or your work life completely unbearable. Mm -hmm. So that is an even worse situation because it doesn't impact you just some of the time, it impacts you all the time. Both of those categories are bad bosses and I, I, I've spoken with hundreds and hundreds of people over the years that have dealt with one or both of those types of situations. So it's important to understand, first of all, that if you are dealing with a bad boss, you're not alone. And there are things you can do about that, which is what we want to talk about. Yeah, and at what point do you put on the brakes and say, you know, I got to do something about this bad boss of mine? Well, certainly if you're in a situation where you believe that your job is in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if, if they're trying to build a case against you, push you out, well, you need to do something about it. Because remember, silence is the same as acceptance. If you have a boss that's building a case against you, well, if you just say, well, I'm, I'm, I'll just put my head down and hope things will get better, they won't get better. And in fact, you may end up losing your job and potentially risk severance and compensation. Obviously, you also have to do something about it if you're bullied, harassed, mistreated. We all have the right 
to work in a harassment-free work environment. So if we are being harassed and mistreated, we shouldn't just ignore it. We shouldn't just leave and then say, well, that's just a bad experience. That's where we have to do something about it. And that's, that's the third question, really. What do you do and, and, and what should you do if you have that bad boss? Because sometimes it's going to be the, the case where the bad boss is the one you would report the bad boss to. Right. right. Well, the first thing is, remember, your bad boss is never going to admit that they're a bad boss. Sure. They're not going to say, yes, I did it, I mistreated this person, I was bullying to them, or, or I did all these other bad things. So you, the employee, have to create a record. So very easy to do that. You can have a, a journal or, or a diary where you write down what happened on what dates. Even better, send the bad boss an email. I know it's not the most pleasant thing, but it works so, so well. Send an email confirming what happened. Uh, boss, I confirmed today that at the meeting you yelled at me and, and said all of those other things to me, or et cetera, whatever it is, create that record. So once you have that record, then think, who can you speak to? HR, is there an HR person? You can go speak to HR and when you give them that evidence, that proof, that things that you've worked hard to put together, it gives you credibility. They're not gonna have to say it's a he said, she said. Is there the owner of the company, someone in a position of authority that you can talk to? Now, if there isn't, then that means you have to deal with it externally through someone like myself. But always keep a record, make sure it's all in writing, and then go speak to the person, the designated person in your office, HR, owner, senior manager, that will allow you to, to tell your side of the story and present your proof. A lot of people are going to be scared. They're going to try to handle it on their own, their own attempt to deal with it. It might fail. Then they're going to feel like the workplace pariah. Maybe they'll be picked on even more by that boss. What do they do at that point? Well, first of all, I understand the fear, but you have to understand that you have the right to complain if something is wrong, whether it's mistreatment, harassment, bad boss, and you can't be punished for it, okay? So no one is allowed to punish you, so you should never be afraid to complain, to speak your mind, to present your, your case and your evidence. Don't be afraid of doing that. Now, if you've tried to do that, nothing has happened. I spoke to HR, HR brushed, uh, brushed it under the table uh, and, and didn't do anything about it. Well, number one, create that record. Send an email to HR confirming that you spoke to them, and then let's talk. At that point, if your boss or, or your HR, your company doesn't do something about that bad boss, that could be considered, depending on the situation, it could be a human rights violation if you're being harassed, for example. It could certainly be considered a constructive dismissal. So the, there's things that we can do about that to, to get you out of that situation. But it starts, if possible, if possible, with you speaking to your HR manager, to your owner of the company, and give them the opportunity to fix that problem. Should you ever just like throw your hands up in the air and quit if you've just, you can't take it anymore, you've done had enough of this boss? Absolutely not. Now, there may be situations where from a strategic standpoint, we want you to leave because it's a constructive dismissal, but we don't do that until we've spoken. Okay, never ever leave, quit, resign because of a bad boss without speaking to me first. We're gonna wanna do this properly. If you just leave, then unfortunately, you're not gonna be able to pursue it later or it's gonna be very difficult to pursue it later. So if you're at your wit's end, you've tried to resolve it, you've spoken with HR, you've documented that nothing has happened, before you leave and hand in that resignation letter, call me. Let's have a chat. Let's do this properly so that you can still get your legal entitlements. Okay, up to this point, we've been raining down pretty heavy on the bad boss. Now, what do you do if, if the boss or manager, uh, if you're on that boss or manager and you're receiving complaints from an employee, now I'm the boss who's the bad boss. And I can see why you would be, <laughs> yeah. but uh, no. The shoe fits. The shoe fits, hey. Uh, no, but the reality is that in all seriousness, if you are the boss no. uh, and, and someone complains against you, the worst thing that you can do is try to go after that person and punish that person. Even if you don't think that, that the allegations against you are correct or legitimate, if you then try to punish that person, that can give that corroboration. That could also be considered a reprisal, which is illegal. So what do you do? Well, you respond, you respond truthfully, honestly give your recollection of events. If you have other evidence, witnesses, other people that can support you, you bring them up as well and you tell your side of the story. But do not fire someone, do not punish them, do not lash out at them. That's the worst thing you can do as a boss.
Again, reaching out any time for these or any other topics we discussed, really simple, 1-855-821-5900, employmentlawyer.ca is the website. Also where you go to find a radio station that carries our long-running radio show as well. And what, phone call number two from our radio shows is coming up right now. Last March, I got laid off, which was a year and two months ago, and everybody got laid off at the same place, right, same time. A few guys already got a call and got paid off at their seventh stage. So I never received a call yet. So I'm just wondering, should I hang on and wait? How long do I have? Another very common yep. question. I've been on the layoff for a while. How long do I have to wait? When is it enough? When is enough enough? Well, the reality is that you don't have to stay on a layoff. In other words, on day one of that layoff, the employee could have chosen to treat that as a termination of their employment and say, enough is enough now. I'm not waiting, I'm treating that as a termination of my employment. So you don't have to wait and wonder and sit and hope that your boss calls you back to work. You can decide to treat that as a termination. Now that is up to you. For most employees, a temporary leave of absence, a temporary layoff, even now during the pandemic, is something that gives you the right to say, that's a termination of my employment. And if it's a termination, severance has to be paid. So your two options always with the layoff is you sit and wait. How long are you going to wait? I have no idea. That's the problem. Or option number two is you can say, I'm not waiting or I've waited enough. Now it's a termination. Now I want my severance. If that's what you've decided, you've gone with that second option, let's talk about it. We'll get to one more phone call from our radio shows, but we have to take a short break first before we get into that. So we'll roll into that break and come right back with you. 1-855-821-5900 and help at employmentlawyer.ca to reach out through email. It's the Employment Law Show. There's more coming up. People think you have to sign back a severance offer by a deadline. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Deadlines are used as a pressure tactic. Make sure the offer is fair before you sign. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. Can insurance companies deny long-term disability claims for mental illness? When you're suffering from a mental health disability, insurance companies just don't understand. But we do. They can absolutely not force you back to work. If your doctors say you are not ready and you know you're not ready, they cannot make you go back to work. If you have a mental health disability and your claim is denied, don't give up. Give us a call and let us fight for you. Go to disabilityrights.ca, discover your rights, fight back, and get what you're owed. People think you aren't owed severance pay if you are fired for a reason. Employmentlawyer.ca says that is a myth. Most for-cause terminations are false, and you are still owed full severance. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. All right, welcome back Employment Law Show. John Scholes, Lior Sanfiru, good to have you back. I mentioned employmentlawyer.ca, the website, to find links to our radio show. I've been doing that for... Coming up on almost 10 years across the country, a variety of radio stations, you will be able to find one near you. We can listen uh, live or online as well. Either way, we get the phone calls into the station all the time. People have the same questions you probably do watching this show for a half hour. So we'll get to our third phone call from our radio show now, Lior. I work for an employer and they're putting me down to three days a week. It's a small company though, so I don't know if... Like, from what I've read, if you work for a very small company, you're only entitled to termination pay and not severance. Is that correct? Do you used to work five days a week? Yes. 20%. Okay. 20% down. Nope. That, that's, a, that's a huge change. Yeah. And any time you, you're talking about a significant change in the terms of employment, in this case, going from five days to three days, that's, of course, that's huge. You have to think constructive dismissal. Significant change in pay, or change in hours, or change in schedule, or change in work location, or a demotion mm -hmm. leads and gives right to say that's a constructive dismissal, that's a termination of employment, and I am owed severance. Now, the other aspect of this is, well, small company versus big right. company. We get that all the time. So let's be very clear. Your minimum entitlements may be affected by the size of the company or the size of the company's payroll. Your full entitlements have nothing, nothing to do with that. Your full entitlements are going to be the same whether you work for a company with one employee or 1,000 employees, okay? Whether you get six months or 12 months or 24 months severance, it's going to be the same. So please, it's a myth, it's a misconception, it's false. Size of the company's payroll, the number of employees is ultimately not going to impact the amount that you are owed, whether it's a regular termination 
or a constructive dismissal. It doesn't matter. It could be a little pizza shop or a multinational. It's uh, the, the severance pay calculator works the same, right? Yeah. If you go to pocketemploymentlawyer.ca, which you could do that right now to find out how much you're owed. By the way, anonymous, free, takes seconds. You, you see, it doesn't ask you. Tell me about the company you're working for. Tell me how many employees. Right. The reason it doesn't ask you is it does not matter. It's going to ask you about the type of job that you have. If you're a manager or a salesperson or a laborer, it's going to ask you about your age and the length of your employment but not the size of the company or, or its payroll, because that's not going to impact your entitlements. Another place you can go for questions, get them answered, terminationquestions.com. Really simple to remember, right? Terminationquestions.com. This one, Lior, from Christina. Christina says, I was fired last week from a middle manager position after working for the company for five years. The severance offer I received only consists of a few days pay. When I asked why it wasn't more, I was told that, uh, well, I was owed a federally regulated employee. That's why. Is that true? <laughs> so federally regulated employees. So I don't know, about 15 or so percent of, of uh, people are regulated federally or work for federally regulated industries, banks, telecommunications, airlines, etc. You're federally regulated. That means that your, your legal rights are governed by a different statute. It doesn't matter. When it comes to termination of your employment, you're still all governed by what we call common law, which is what our courts have determined someone is owed if they're terminated in given situations. So for this lady, even though she works for a federally regulated employer, she's going to be owed the same amount of severance as she would have been receiving if she was working for a provincially regulated employer. So rather than tell you how much she's owed, let me show you how much she's owed. Let's go to pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. And let's use our severance calculator tool there. So she's been there for five years. Her employer said, well, I'm going to give you a few days. It's going to be nice to you because you're federally regulated. As you see on the screen right there, she's owed eight to nine months pay. Eight to nine months. The same would have been true if she was for a, uh, working for a provincially regulated company. So federally regulated, banks, et cetera, provincially regulated, all others. Your severance entitlements are based on your age, the type of job and the length of your employment, not whether the company is federally or provincially regulated. Again, terminationquestions.com. This one's such a beauty. We got two minutes, but I want to slide it in, Lior. This one from Paul says, one week after turning 60, I received an email from my manager explaining the company's long-term plans to revitalize their vision without <laughs> me on the team. Rather than fire me, they have offered to accept my resignation between now and the next three months. Do I have to resign? Well, here's the thing. That's, that's just silly because a resignation is something that you do voluntarily and unilaterally. Yep. It's not a, something that someone gives you the right to do, okay? You can be the only one that decides if you resign. If he decides he doesn't want to work there anymore, he's had a good run, he wants to go and spend time with his family or find another job, he can resign. If the company doesn't want him there for its reasons, that's a termination, and they have to pay severance. So there's no such thing as, oh, I'll accept your resignation, or I expect your resignation. Keep expecting. You're not getting it. If you don't want me there, you can terminate employment. The other thing is this. If they want him out of there because of his age, that's age discrimination. That's, right. that's a human rights violation. That's illegal. So there's a lot here to discuss. He needs to speak to me. It's not right, it's illegal, and it's certainly not going to be something he should be resigning over. Well, we could be talking severance and human rights damages as well. That could be a lot of money for this guy. From a instead of, of a resignation to damages, so please do not resign ever, ever, unless it's voluntary and unilateral. Again, Paul used terminationquestions.com. You can use the same thing again, terminationquestions.com. You write your answers in there, you leave them for Lior and his, his uh, firm, rather, and they'll answer them. And the phone call, 1-855-821-5900. Catch again, one the last show. Closed captioning of this program is brought to you in part by severancepaycalculator.com. Find out how much you are owed right now. severancepaycalculator.com. People think their employer can make changes to their job. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Your employer can't change your pay, hours, or duties. You may be entitled to full severance pay. Always check with the employment lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca.